Hey everyone! If you missed today's PD, well, don't worry. The entire point of this presentation is to demonstrate how learning can take place at your own pace. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Avery Balaspas, and I'm the English department chair here at Lincoln. Um, I teach English 2 and American Lit, and if you need my email, you can find it in the slides, or you can just look up my name and it should show up uh, in your sender box. If you want to follow along with the video, there is a Nearpod slide deck, uh, which is where these slides are located. And after this intro slide, you're going to find a student-facing trailer that Modern Classrooms or MCP made as a quick animation to break down what their teaching model is, which is what I'm going to cover in a moment. Tell me if this has happened to you. And I'm not going to play the entire video for us. You can watch that on your own. It's a pretty neat animation that kind of helps really break down what is Modern Classroom in just a few minutes. So one thing that I want to be clear about, despite the PD agenda, sorry, I believe uh, that was on Friday. Sorry, depending on when I'm recording this, it's today or Friday. The admin wrote tech best practices. Uh, this is not a tech presentation. Though I don't disagree that this does incorporate some best practices, but this isn't a tech guru support or tips and tricks overview like maybe Mark Kino would teach effortlessly, but I will be showing this model with heavily infused tech like Nearpod or making videos, but I want to be clear that this is not a tech-based teaching model. It's just the way that I approach it. I heavily use video to go about self-pacing. I also just like making videos in general. And to make another thing clear, MCP is not a flipped classroom. So a flipped classroom does have blended learning with technology and videos, but it still requires students to complete some sort of reading or content at home. And then the live learning and engagement happens in class. So you do reading at home and then you engage in a problem in the classroom. But instead, here's what's going on in my classroom or a modern classroom. And you know, even at home, should a student choose to do so. So there's blended instruction. This is where students can access new content through teacher created videos like this one, self paced structure, where students learn at their own pace within a unit of study, and they can take control of their learning and move through the unit at their own pace. And then lastly, there's mastery based grading, which is a focus on students demonstrating mastery and understanding of content instead of just testing or lecturing one day and then moving on to a topic the next day, regardless of the agenda or checklist that we're trying to meet. Sound familiar? Well, a lot of the language that I'm going to be using and the way this model works really aligns with the issues that were brought up in our PDs this week. Instructional coherence, anti-racist practices, IEP and 504 accommodations, chronic absenteeism, GVC, deeper learning, academic ownership, and demonstration of learning. These things definitely align. So with this instructional model, previously, my students often struggled to master material because we typically operate in a one-size-fits-all framework. You know, where one instructor teaches all the students the same lesson, same day, regardless of students' prerequisite skills, attendance patterns, unique academic needs, social emotional experiences. And by making these instructional videos, it actually freed me up to work with students in smaller groups. So that's that one on one time with groups to reteach and address any misunderstandings in the moment. Students work through a unit at their own pace and ultimately show true understanding or mastery of material. And if you want, you can click on the the Modern Classrooms link in the slides to kind of look at an overview of what their organization is all about, if you'd like to take a deeper dive. So in the PD, what we would have done, a famous quote from their, one of their podcast episodes on Spotify is the best way to learn the model is to do the model. Over on our staff Google Classroom, there was a lesson one and two that you could go through and you can take a look at those resources at your own time, self-paced. But instead, we're just going to move along and talk about how the MCP instructional model and its efficacy with teachers in general. So the impacts of MCP on teachers. MCP is data driven because teachers spend class time on supporting students based on live measures of academic mastery. And you will kind of look at that with uh, the public pacing tracker in a moment. MCP makes teaching sustainable. Teachers spend less time managing behavior and more time supporting student learning. And on the students, 21st century skills, students become self-directed, self-aware young adults very much like our graduate profile, right? Um, differentiation. Every student is appropriately challenged every day, regardless of the learning level and authentic mastery. Students internalize that progress is contingent on mastery, not completion. And so that's important to recognize when you're thinking about grading using the MCP model. So MCP has teachers conduct a survey before implementing the model and after. 
By the end of the school year, we can see that some of the data has doubled, if not quadrupled. And I'm not entirely sure if you can see if we can we zoom in. We're just going to go back over to Google Slides really quick so we can actually see and read the data. So the statements that they had us ask were, I always have something challenging to do in class. I can teach myself new academic skills. I can complete challenging assignments without giving up. I really understand what I'm learning. I enjoy learning. I am capable of learning anything. My teacher knows my strengths and weaknesses, and I have a good personal relationship with my teacher. So the thing that kind of shocks me with these five final statements, it's not just me personally, but when, when I look at the data, I see the power that this has for teaching in general, that it's improved perspectives on learning drastically, especially these three right here. I really understand what I'm learning. I enjoy learning and I am capable of learning anything. Before my class, 20% of my students did not like learning. And it's so incredible to see that students' perspective on education changed just because of this teaching model, just because they were given agency and to take control of the way that they learn. As for teachers, Modern Classroom and John Hopkins University did an independent study of about, what does it say here? 55 teachers and about 1,900 students. So 28 of those educators were modern classroom teachers, and then 27 of them surveyed were traditional teachers who weren't using MCP. I don't think you can read it, but I'll read the statements to you. It says, I can easily help students who have missed class to catch up. I am effectively able to serve students at all levels of understanding. I am able to teach my students effective study skills, and I am able to work closely with each of my students during class. And so teachers using MCP have almost 100% across the board in each section. And I agree with them. With this model, I am able to easily help students who have missed class because they can pick up right where they left off. I can definitely effectively serve students at all levels of understanding, our students with IEPs, our EL students, giving them that one-on-one -on -one attention they need. This itself creates self-directed learners where students are gaining autonomy to take control of their learning and learn effective study skills in the process of going back and reviewing notes if they have to review something or even effectively using technology to pace their own learning. So to kind of wrap up how MCP affects students, I want to bring up the discourse that we had on chronic absenteeism and attendance issues that link to our hall wanderers. Towards the end of our school year in May, ILT brought up the issue of how do we get our students back in class. And also part of our Q&A during the Anti-Racist PD this week was that folks were looking for actionable steps. And I believe that there are ones in the classroom that I've taken with MCP that kept my Hall Wanderers coming back to class and actually completing their work. So if you watch the overview on how I implement MCP, you may have seen this progress tracker. And I project this publicly every day to the students so they can see where they are in the unit. So they can see if they're behind pace, on pace, ahead of pace, if they have to revise, or if they completed the unit. And to be very clear, this tracker is non-evaluative. It doesn't reflect their grade. It doesn't reveal who has an A or who has an F. It's simply just a way for students to know where they are in the unit. And the wonderful thing that I've seen with this tracker, as many people expressed misconceptions about this, that, well, what if students feel embarrassed or if they're traumatized that they're being exposed to the class? I've actually had more positive feedback from students and parents appreciating that I have a pulse check on exactly where their students are, what they need help with, and where they're going. A lot of parents have emailed me, wow, thank you for this detailed information. Now I know what my son needs to work on, especially because they can ref cross-reference it with how my Google Classroom is structured. And the this pacing tracker also allows students to collaborate with one another. So let's say I'm Marvell and I'm working on lesson five, but I'm kind of confused and I don't really know how to get it done. Well, it's clear that Luis is on lesson six and he finished it already. So maybe I, I can ask him for help before I go to Mr. B to see how he finished the lesson. Oftentimes, I'll call on these three students who are on lesson five at the beginning of the period and say, Salome, Mitsumi, and Carlos, come meet over. We're going to review uh, lesson five together and we're going to go over the feedback that I gave you before you move on to lesson six. So the thing about my hall wanderers is that sometimes they were actually ahead of pace. But when they came in from wandering between passing periods and then they saw their name in behind pace or revise, they were super motivated. In fact, instead of feeling embarrassed or degraded by being behind pace, they grabbed a Chromebook and then they got to work. 
towards the end of the spring, I had a lot of sophomores that were failing my class. And almost half of my class, especially those hall wanderers, were mostly black and brown SPED or EL students. And regardless, I gave students the choice and asked them, what do you think you're capable of learning? So I had one-on-one with each of my students below an 80%, hall wanderers, students with IEPs, 504s, my EL students, and even just students who just had below an 80%. Uh, We checked off things that they already completed and discussed what they could complete to get a certain grade. So if you see over here, there's like a 70% line, there's an 80% line, and then there's a 100% line for lessons they're behind on. And then also I did another one for the final. Though I gave students this checklist, a lot of them still procrastinated. But blended instruction, self-pacing, mastery-based grading, it allowed these students to demonstrate what they did learn from this semester instead of failing them for what they didn't. And before I get to this Q&A, I noticed that there was a general consensus from folks that were feeling like, but Avery, you're an English teacher, or Avery, this model, it doesn't work for me. And I just wanna tell you that it's very normal to feel that way because I thought the exact same thing. How am I gonna self-pace a novel? Especially when there's a looming essay that we have to meet, the grading period's coming up, I have all this other work to grade, or I have all these other lessons to plan. I have deadlines to meet, but then I I thought to myself, I already have students who don't keep up with the reading and especially in a traditional sense, they lose interest once they fall too far behind. And then I don't even know what to do. So what do I have to lose? So around this time last year, maybe a week after school started, uh, I took modern classrooms, free online course where they walk you through how to start implementing this teaching model. Then after that, I applied to get their certification because I wanted to see if this was really worth my time and if it was worth sharing with all of you. I even took another summer mentorship program because I wanted to really like hone in and make sure that I got this down before presenting it to you in case folks really do want to implement. But the biggest thing that I want to mention in regards to the feeling of this teaching model isn't really for me is that through this process, I met dozens if not hundreds of teachers across the country who are doing this model obviously digitally, and even internationally. When I was doing the mentorship program in the spring around April, I was put in a breakout room with another teacher who was from Japan, who was implementing modern classrooms. And this map here, it only shows those who are distinguished modern classroom educators like myself who have the credential, but it's not tracking the thousands of teachers like yourself who are looking to implement just a part of this or who are who are using the whole model. They just didn't want to get the certification or they just didn't want to agree to publicly place themselves on, on MCP's website. So now it's time for this question here. What advice would I give a teacher who is launching Modern Classroom for the first time? I would probably go back and do a few things. I would take time to explore the exemplar units on Modern Classroom's website because there's a lot here from elementary school, kindergarten to fifth grade, all the way to electives and world languages. And you can take a look at some of these examples and see what's, what teachers have done. Um, you can take a look at their lessons that they have how they've structured their modern classroom. See, I don't have a Google website like this. Uh, This person laid it out very nicely, Um, but mine is more video-based. So for some, this can be a curricular shift, even a pedagogical shift. But in this case, this model works for you. Find out what piques your interest. If you're curious about accommodations, then then what about mastery-based grading and revision and feedback towards mastery? Or... Maybe you're interested in the public pacing tracker. If digital one, maybe a physical one, you could put it on a whiteboard, use magnetic name tags. I've seen some teachers even use clothes pins and a ribbon to show where students were in the unit process. And if your fear is the technology aspect of it, like I'm doing, well, don't worry because a lot of folks still will hang up their hanging file folders or manila folders and put the worksheets for lessons one through six So students know exactly where to go, where to pick it up, and then go back to their table and self-pace through the unit. And so some advice that I would give some folks when getting started is with blended instruction, really think about what resource could you make to help truant, sick, chronic absentee, or even athletes who fell behind and need to catch up on the lecture day that they missed. You can make one video that talks about the basic skills of the quadratic formula or what is a mitochondria. And that way you don't have to spend time reteaching those students. They can just go back to the video, reference it, and then catch up with where they left off. Or even for students with IEPs and 504s who need more time to revisit the lesson, that video could help them pause, rewind, rewatch it, 
on their own time. So self-pacing. Think about what lessons for those who are ready to move on or who need more of a challenge. Maybe even who need more support or for those who have to revisit or revise a lesson. Self-pacing isn't just me sending the student on a bike without the training wheels. Self-pacing is very is a very guided process. If students do need help, I will be there for them. I'm not just going to give them all the videos and all 30 lessons of the unit and just be like, all right, figure it out. I'll see you guys in three weeks. That's not how it works. I'm constantly circulating around the classroom, especially when students need my help or if they are in this revised section and I needed to talk them through the feedback that I gave them. And then when it comes to mastery-based grading, one thing that I really want to hone in that revision isn't just peer reviewing. Though peer reviewing is great and I use a lot of it uh, in essay writing workshops, there's more to revision than just you know, uh, for me, peer reviewing activities that never really work. I really want to talk my students through the feedback that I'm giving them and making sure that they understand how to improve their assignment and get the grade that they deserve. And if a student failed an exam, are you going to leave it as a 45% or are you going to give them an, another opportunity to show, to show what they've learned and it, not just partial credit, giving them the grade that they deserve? Are you willing to make that cultural shift for the student that's proved to you that they actually mastered the content? Of course, within the given time constraints of your deadlines or the grading period or the unit ending. So I've had colleagues who I've shared my process with here. Um, They've tried out different aspects of the teaching model. Some of them did voiceover instructions. Some of them made a video for their students to reference so they didn't have to reteach the concept. Some of them even started making unit trackers because they found that kind of transparency very helpful for some of their students. And this teaching model is designed to fit you, not the one that I'm doing. If videos aren't going to fly for you and you still want to give just regular instruction, that's great. If we again look at some of the example units, like this visual art one here, this teacher is simply just giving instructions in her lessons and then the documents are attached. There's even a slide deck in here of different drawing techniques. So it's not a matter of being super tech savvy as many of us already have these Google Docs made and maybe this, and I'm pretty sure students have a paper copy of this worksheet on the right, because they're gonna draw eyes, nose, and mouth for each of these lessons. So I wanna bring up some of the topics or questions, I can't fully remember them, that were brought up in today's PD in our Q&A time, limited Q&A time. Um, So technology, I just spoke about that. Um, Grading was brought up. So how do I determine a student's grade who has done way less than than a student who has had 100% in the class? And so folks, um, we were having a discussion about this pacing tracker here. Yeah, how do how do you determine a student's grade for someone who's been ahead of pace, who is doing awesome in the class, but then what about these people that are on lesson one, the entire, I don't know, however long it's been? My answer to that is an advice from MCP is that let the chaos ensue. You have to let go of control, and that's not easy. That's a huge release of responsibility onto the students and onto rather controlled chaos that's going on in the classroom because of the self-pacing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not giving this person who is on lesson one over here who did 50% of the work in A at the end of the semester. There's still a lot of work they didn't complete. So obviously I'm putting in zeros in the book for all of that. Let's say based on this checklist, many of my students, uh, they didn't necessarily complete this, this entire thing here, but a lot of them did get to the 70% or 80% line from their 32% in the class. Depending on their work, you know, it's accuracy and mastery for me. That helps determine whether or not I give that student that 100%. If, but you know, a student, (laughs) I didn't have any students that actually completed all the missing assignments when I threw them that last lifeline. And we're here, you know, end of April, beginning of May, finishing off the semester before finals. So revision, it can sound like a lot of work to revisit old assignments again and again. And especially me as an English teacher, you know, we have to read everything, especially if it's like building an essay. But because of MCP, like let's say with the essay process, me going back to revise a student's work constantly, because I've worked with them so closely one-on-one through the intro, through the body paragraph into the conclusion, by the time I'm grading their final draft, there's barely any reading for me to do because I've seen the progress and because I've actually had the time to know what's going on. And of course, I'm not doing that with every single student, but it does make grading easier. And with revisions, you might think that I'm taking a lot of stuff home. I'm actually not. Last year, I didn't take a single thing home except essays, of course, because those I can't grade those in class necessarily. But any of my smaller assignments or the mastery checks, I typically graded them on the spot as soon as a student turned it in, especially if they had some sort of revision or feedback that I gave. 
I'd send it back to them. They'd see on the tracker that they need to revise. If they needed help, I work with them and then I grade it right then and there. And later on, I'll update Synergy. Sometimes I'll actually even just tell students because they're all self-pacing and working together that, hey guys, I'm gonna be grading. If you need anything from me, I'll be at my desk. Another thing that was brought up was how I got started. So I went gung-ho and full steam ahead on MCP and I don't expect anyone to do that 100% during the school year, nor do I advise it because I did lose a lot of sleep and a lot of time doing this, but I really wanted to get this off the ground and to see if this self-pacing model would work at its fullest potential. And so I actually started with self-pacing a non-academic unit. You could also start designing a self-paced unit for maybe two units from now and maybe try it then. So you're, you know, you're kind of slowly building it out uh, when you get there. And and that non-academic unit that I'm talking about is actually more of a paper-based unit until it got to the digital presentation. This is what my Google Classroom looks like. Under the Classwork tab, um, I labeled it Unit 1, Community Building and Mental Health. So I start off the school year with this unit, and all of the video and practice assignments are under that unit in the Classwork tab. They should be done in order, and if students get lost or confused, I instruct them you know, to either ask a friend first before coming to me because I might be helping someone else and then they can come ask me afterwards. And so some of these units are paper-based even though there is a digital copy. There's a goal setting lesson, there's a podcasting lesson on what is mental health, there's a brainstorming lesson because uh, the presentation they're gonna do is like a very formal introduction of to the class of this is who I am in the context of my past, present, and future. And then they start designing it which is typically a Google slide or Sometimes kids make a poster if they want to, and then they present. And then the last two things in this unit is a reflection on how they felt they did, and also just giving me feedback. So this is a very short unit. But most of this didn't even have a video. <laughs> I think the most digital thing that I did was for a worksheet I recorded and voiced over the instructions. So when students went home, they could listen to me explaining it in case they forgot how to navigate the worksheet, which many did. So. To be clear, these aren't all new lessons that I made. It's all the same content that I've been doing or that I developed over the past few years of teaching, but I laid it out in a way to help students navigate it on their own. So thanks to the modern classroom teaching model, I was able to meet my students one-on-one -on -one at least like six different times, if not more. And that's not including, you know, the circulating desk time. This is like conferencing check-ins one-on-one. -on -one. And that's because of the self-pacing, because students are able to self-direct themselves during class time, I'm able to actually check in and call in students one-on-one -on -one to see where they're at and how I can help them. And again, to be clear, the, the whole classroom itself doesn't have to be very tech heavy like my setup. Just like the exemplar unit that we looked at with the visual arts teacher, it's completely different from the way that I do it. Again, people have had pacing trackers that aren't digital. I like using it digitally because I can update it on Google Sheets and it populates and shows the students. Some other folks like using a physical one. I even tried that too. I made, if some of you walked into my classroom last year, you would have subbed for my classroom. You may have seen a big giant calendar and I used magnetic name tags to have students move them along so they knew when lesson four was due and then they're like, all right, I'm done lesson four and they move it over to lesson five. And again, there are teachers across the country that do this teaching model as early as kindergarten all the way to high school. So anybody can really design this model and, it, and again, reinforcing the idea that it doesn't have to be so tech heavy. So if you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. If you're interested in learning more about Modern Classroom, you can email me or stop by NB14 or observe my classroom and just have a conversation with me. I'm actually gonna leave a Google form to gauge if there's interest with folks on using this model or getting some more support on getting started. If there's enough, maybe I can ask admin to start a PLC for this or have another opportunity to present these materials. I highly, highly encourage folks to take the free course that they have if you're really interested in uh, implementing aspects of this this year and you aren't able to reach out to me because you can self-pace yourself through their free course. Again, I hope this is really helpful for you all. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.